Hola, hola, my name is Ricardo. I am the host of the Lucha Jovers podcast here in the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. We are a Spanish speaking show dedicated to discussing and analyzing pro wrestling from all across the world. From AW to CMLL, we talk about American wrestling, Japanese wrestling, and of course, Lucha Libre. If something big happened in the pro wrestling world, we will talk about it. So if you know Spanish or have a friend that knows Spanish or want to practice your Lucha Libre pronunciations, go listen to the Lucha Jovers podcast right here in the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Nos vemos por ahí. Hey kids, do you like wrestling? Well, we like wrestling too. We are Shake Them Ropes here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Myself and Chris Novembrino kind of doing a lazy river of wrestling criticism, going through the news and whatever happened in stateside television wrestling. And also, you know what? Sometimes we just like to watch old stuff and talk about that too. Love for you to give us a listen. If you haven't already, we are Shake Them Ropes here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. To the highway, in a brand new day, gotta let it go. So back to open the voice gate for march 7th 2023 we are members of the voices of wrestling podcast network you can find us on the voices of wrestling podcast network feed or our own dedicated podcast feed on all podcast platforms applications and while you're at it throw a five-star rating and review on apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, spotify whatever you get your podcast it's the best way for people to find out the show uh you could follow us on twitter at open voice gate if you'd like to donate to the show Click the link in the show notes. It'll take you to our redcircle.com landing site where you click the red boxes to sponsor this podcast and you can set up a one-time, a recurring donation. Uh, no obligation whatsoever, but we would like to thank all of our previous and current donors. I'm one of your hosts. It's your old pal, Mike Spears. Join alongside, as always, Case Low. In Case, big week in Dragon Gate, but also a big week in our lives. How are you doing, buddy? Uh, well, you know, I got my red circle donation check this morning, so I'm in a very good mood. You know, if you ever if you ever want happy, positive case, you just hit the donation button on that red circle page and I'll be in a good mood every week from here on out. Thank you to everybody who donated very genuinely. That is uh, very much appreciated. A, a busy week for you and I, you know, I think we both did two sh written show reviews over at VoicesWrestling.com because you did the cork and show for dragon gate and the first night of champion gate and i did the junior all-star wrestling festival and the second night of champion gate which uh, by the way doesn't that junior all-star show already feel like it happened a month ago yeah no it's it was like such like a weird like the the vibe of everything and it's not like a bad vibe but the feeling of everything like kiji muto's retirement show feels like it might as well be last year yeah, time and its sickening crimes. It it just it never slows down. It never stops. There's always content to watch. There's always content to consume. I mean, I'm looking at a list right now. I've got a few hours worth of CMLL and of all things 2023 Osaka Pro to catch up on at some point and and not to mention the fact that I haven't even finished the big AEW pay-per-view from this past week. Uh but we're not here to talk about all that wrestling. You and I have plenty of Dragon Gate to talk about tonight but before we get to that mike i don't think i asked you how you're doing how are you doing i am doing all things considered uh somehow trying to navigate now a full-on move to texas i'm doing all right case you know i'll be better next week this time next week i will be ebullient how about that wow what a word 
Hey, I was a big vocabulary kid, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> what other cool things did you do, Mike? Uh, let, let's see. Uh, make. Yeah, I I did do taekwondo and soccer. Like I wasn't just like <laughs> someone who stayed inside reading the thesaurus all day. Case okay? so I was a well-rounded classical individual. I had a classical education. I'll say you that you way. played soccer growing up in Texas. Yeah, yeah, that that uh, presented more questions than it was worth, to be quite honest. But... Yeah, there's there's a King of the Hill episode about this. Oh, and it's very true to life. Like, so my high school, uh, back before, uh, way before I went there, but he had like the high school had a historical coach who like everything in the in the football and the sports is named after him. Like, I don't think we won a state title at that time, but he was the person who was known to, like, make the football program into something. And he always had a thing that he would go around to everyone's house in July and go to every high school male's uh, family and ask them, all right, what position you play? And if you say you did not play football, he this is the 60s and 70s, immediately question the masculinity of you. <laughs> like, like, like it's a historical thing and i just think like if this guy was alive in the late 90s early 2000s oh the field day he would have with me when it'd be like no i do theater and i play soccer i'm sorry i can't play your hand egg i i that, I, that is I, I don't know about this mike season. spears boy i just don't know about this mike spears boy something about him was a little off I, I mean, I've been called not right so many different times, but I did have <laughs> now, now case. Do you, do you want a little bit of some cow town nostalgia to get us going before we start uh, talking look, about I, all this crazy <laughs> stuff that happened in Dragon Gate this last week? There's nothing I want more than, quote, cow town nostalgia. Why don't you go for it, Mike? So also at my high school and later became a family friend of mine was a guy who was referred to as coach. He was a football coach, as one can say. He, he went around the Fort Worth high schools. I actually got to see his team get coached against Helix, which if you are a San Diego Chargers fan of the early 2000s, you'll know that Helix High is where one Ladanian Tomlinson played. But that's not the nostalgia. He, a, a big thing, at least in my part of town, is detached garages where people, like, because the houses are older, so people didn't have garages like in the 1930s like they did not exist then so much later people built a detached garage and his he called the manly man cave of which all he did was open up his garage door have a whole bunch of archery uh just targets and he would sit in his driveway working on his archery because in his words it doesn't seem like a fair fight to go at it with a rifle against a deer so I believe in archery, and he taught me how to use a blowgun at age eight. Coach was a fantastic man. When I say I have no response to that, I mean it. That is that is quite the tale, Mike. That is very Texas. Hey, people think I'm the worst Texan ever. I uh, I just grew into being that bad. But l let's get into the let's get into the actual program. Uh, a lot of stuff happening over the last week. Uh, three major shows. The big. I would say the first big weekend of Dragon Gate's year, and the biggest topic coming out of this, of course, is Champion Gate and the Dream Gate, with Strong Machine J making his first challenge of the Open to Dream Gate title against Shun, who was making his first defense of the second reign. It was Shun who retained with a tricky jackknife cradle after eating one machine suplex, kicking out, getting put up for the second one. He was doing the spin around before it, and Shun shot the uh, double and rolled him up and got out of there. But the main event was of the Champion Gate weekend. The Strong Machine J revolution is not here. We're still in the era of Shun Skywalker. In case we talked about this with, uh, with uh, Champion Gate weekend, it is the proving grounds. I know you had the written review for this one, but just your one sentence uh, decision, did, sh did Strong Machine J pass the test? Absolutely. I, I think the big takeaway from this weekend is that Dragon Gate needed to check off a number of boxes. You know, on the first night, we needed Jason Lee to cement his status as one of the best foreigners of all time. They did that. We needed gold class to prove that there's still uh, there, there's still worthwhile investment in the idea of a 2023 BB Hulk. And they did that. 
the twin gate match those are four guys that delivered and they checked off the box they delivered and then this main event you have the situation the statistic that i'm absolutely obsessed with you know we talked last week about how this was strong machine j's 11th singles match of all time nine in dragon gate two in riku dragon pro this being the ninth him versus shun skywalker here it was shun skywalker's 10th career open the dream gate match strong machine j had wrestled one more singles match than skywalker had wrestled total dream gate matches was this a match of the year contender absolutely not was it the best match of shun's reign no absolutely not it was probably up to this point the best singles match of strong machine j's career but if we get away from match quality the thing that is ultimately you know a nice benefit but does not matter in the context of what we're talking about strong machine j came out of this weekend in a better position than he entered it in. And that is the goal. That is what they did. A big thumbs up seal of approval for the big picture stuff coming out of Champion Gate in Osaka. Yeah, and with this big test with Strong Machine J, the thing that got me about this is just, you, you think about the mask. Like it is probably not one like the top 10 masks you think of but the strong machine mask i mean there's a reason why multiple companies still make jokes off the strong machine masks that's why stardom does it it is kind of historical uh mask but like being able to do this kind of match with a complete closed face match mask was incredible like like that is a display of charisma and comfort and jay that I really wanted to see coming out of this. And it is something that I think is quite remarkable. And we've talked about this is he is a very charismatic guy. He is incredibly charismatic. And you got that so much through this match. He got his mask torn part way through exactly what you wanted to see, but just like the presence of mind of strong machine J to have this kind of match look strong in defeat. Like it was very clear that it was like, Shun was like, Nope, I can't take this again. I can easily shoot the double, get the jackknife, get out of here. That makes Strong Machine J look strong. And then the promo that Strong Machine J cut after a loss, you know, I mean, I'm not saying that he is a completely set and made man, but it is something that now he has passed the test, getting him kind of, at least in my books, towards that Shimizu tier of now can credibly be a Dreamgate challenger whenever you need him. And that is such such a benefit coming out of this week like that that was like the leading thing like this was an overall test case this was the essay question and 40 points of your test was towards it and i would say that they probably got a 38 or 39 out of 40 in this in this portion of the test i just put a picture i just retweeted it on the open the voice gate twitter account at open voice gate you can see from the weekly piero magazine this week a great photo of strong machine j in the ring with his mask ripped and it's it's a great encapsulation of something that I think in a few years we're going to be able to look back really fondly on. You know, I, d I don't know where you stand. I, I guess I'll ask you this question before I continue my little soliloquy here. But with the information we have now, and granted, you know, we don't have that crystal ball as much as we'd like to have it. Mike, do you see a, a scenario where Strong Machine J is ever an Open the Dreamgate champion? Yes, I did really? not. Okay, all right, really? Okay. Yeah, I think that he is someone that, like, charisma-wise, he pulls it off. He is a... Since he's found himself, like, I, I can't... Like, there's not a box that I wouldn't check with him. Like, I can see a future where he is a Dreamgate champion. Do I think it's a guarantee now? No, but that was not a path forward that was open to him until he went through what he went through Sunday. Th that is absolutely true, is... I don't think anybody, in at the very least in our bubble, anybody that, that just watches him as a consumer, as a viewer, as a fan, put him in that stratosphere before this weekend, but I think it's realistic to at least put him in that bubble of Shimizu-esque contenders. I, I think Shimizu is really the perfect comp here of, uh, you know, if you're going to slate these guys, you know, main event or upper mid-card or mid-card or and beyond, Strong Machine J seems like a a once every cycle dream gate challenger an upper mid carter and maybe one day if he plays his cards right he can you know secure that title that was something that i definitely 
uh, for as much as I like him, was not considering him to be over the weekend, but coming out of this week, and I think you have to look at that as a possibility. I guess what I want to know from you, there, there's a few other big picture thoughts that I have here, but we haven't talked about these shows at all. I read your review at voiceofwrestling.com of night one. I, you know, My review is up there uh, for night two, this show. What are your thoughts on the match? Kind of walk us through what you were experiencing as, as you watched this unfold. Well, for me, it was something that this was a match that I can't say that I was immediately into it because they went for like the brawling and with like this, especially given how they set the match, like it was going to be more of a walk and brawl early on. But as soon as they started tearing the mask, and as soon as that eye port became open, you kind of got to see the side of Strong Machine J unleashed that I wanted to see so badly. And the way that they played off the interferences, I thought was pretty well done. Strong, uh, Strong Machine F, that guy has a problem about Git. Whoever they base his programming around is someone who really needs to learn that if he's seconding a championship match, he can't cross the plane, you know? like. Do you think, <laughs> real quick, because... You, me, and all the other dorks listening adore that spot where in, in a big Dragon Gate Dream Gate match, there's a 2.9 count, and the second rushes the ring thinking it's a three. Do you think that spot would get over in America, or are people too stupid to understand that? I just think that seconds are, it would have to be like Stokely halfway as I'm watching Elevation right now, jumping into the ring. Like the whole entire concept of a second is just completely out of the picture, and north american wrestling do you so think a feel, baby face could get away with it in north american wrestling yes like i think that you would have to do it really old school way like like you know what it would have to have been let me tell you the scenario case okay, this will sound insane it would have had to have been two years ago with the varsity blondes it would have to be like brian pillman jr getting into the ring to like bad to, to like so, try to celebrate with griff garrison scoring like a near fall in a tnt eliminator match if that makes sense. Hot take, I really miss the Varsity Blondes. Also, as you're watching Dark Elevation, I'm watching some uh, Los Brazos on my TV. Oh, there you go. Oh, my God. What, what a trio. These guys, I've got... I, I just randomly turned this on. I've got some, you know, universal... Uh, Hamada universal comp tape going right now. And these Brazos clips that they're showing are unbelievable. Anyways, oh, go ahead. Oh, oh, people don't get how good uh, Porky was before he became the comedy character. And specifically against Hamada, I, I think oh, yeah. they are they are some of Hamada's best opponents. Like you, you go Pero Aguayo, and then God, uh, they, uh, you know they might be they might be the next best thing. I'm trying to think of of who else I like watching Hamada against, and the answer is everybody. But specifically, the work that he's done against those guys is always super captivating. So I, I don't know how we got off on a 1992 universal tangent here, but to bring things back to 2023 and the Dreamgate match we were just talking about, it, you know, Shun's big matches are really interesting to me because we saw this formula begin with the Yoshioka match, obviously, and I, 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 and I think we saw a step forward here to where now I kind of have a prediction of what every big Shun Dreamgate match during this reign is going to look like going forward. And it's, it's a little bit structured like a classic dream gate match. You know, these matches are going to start really slow. It's going to be very methodical, very plotting. And whereas in 2007, 2008, 2009, you know, you're kind of waiting for counters and reversals and a prolonged finishing stretch that takes you home. Now we're waiting on Shun to go from like an eight on the viciousness scale to a 10 and when he hits that 10, all of a sudden, then you know you're in business. And, and that's when the match really picks up. And that was the story here where, you know, Shun dumps Strong Machine J to the floor, attacks him with all these chairs. And then when they come back in the ring, you know, he starts ripping the mask. Yagi goes down. And then when the chairs are introduced into the ring, that's when this match really takes a step up. Strong Machine J lariating the chair is one of those great more heart than brains moments that I think really solidifies the current state of Strong Machine J. And, you know, there was a point in time where I don't know if anybody was a harsher critic of Strong Machine J than I was. And over the last year, there haven't been a lot of people championing him more than I have because 
I, I don't know where you stand on this, Mike, but I remember watching a post Strong Machine Army, Strong Machine J, this being really in the time of the generational war and Team Dragon Gate, where I watched a guy who was lost. He was unable to shed basically the dead act that was before him and unable to transition into the now. And now it doesn't matter what he does going forward. He's in natural vibes now when he fits in. It doesn't matter if he's a heel or a face going forward. I have no doubt that he can fit into whatever he does. And it's taken a complete character reconstruction. It's a point that I didn't know if he was going to be able to get to, but he was able to get to it. So not only did he stay true to his character in this match, but he had relatable worldly charisma that wasn't there in the strong machine army because of the way the gimmick was presented. But once that ended, it certainly wasn't there. And there was a long time where I didn't know if he'd be able to adapt the way that he has. And it, you know what? Really? You're kind of beating around the bush here. Okay. So I, I, I'm going to be the straight shooter here. He stopped being a legacy tribute act. And he started being his own guy. Yes. Completely. And that's, that's what it was. And the thing that, you, you know, really kind of picked up for him for that I noticed was during the first uh, open the beautiful game when they were up in Sapporo doing uh, a PK contest, he was cracking everyone up when he was out there because he's like a big J League. That's the soccer league in Japan fan. Like he's a huge fan. I think he's a Yokohama fan, I believe, because he's from Yokohama. But uh, he was just like, just like showing it and it was like almost like radiating like through him and like he did have like the open mouth mask so you could hear him clearly but he didn't really need that i feel like it's kind of crazy that you have this guy who has this crowd uh connection being able to do this through his father's mask and when that never was a case with harada senior you know like becoming his own man was the thing that took him from like being lost being like as important as Yosuke San Maria was in Team Dragon Gate to now being a Champion Gate main eventer. You know, I spoke to somebody last week, and I don't, I don't even know if I talked to you about this. I, I spoke to somebody who goes to shows in Japan, and this is a sentiment that's been shared by people that know Strong Machine J personally with me, is, uh, I, I, well, I guess I, I, I want to be clear, the person that goes to shows, not the person uh, that, that knows Strong Machine J personally, was relating to me, you know, think about all the negative impact the bad will per se that kaisuke akuda racked up during his time in drangate you know making guys around him less popular because akuda refused to adapt he didn't understand the culture he wasn't the guy that people were rooting for from a a fan base perspective and from you know quite frankly a company perspective Strong Machine J is the opposite of that. You know, the sentiment that was shared with me by the person that goes to shows is this is a guy who everybody wants to succeed. He's a guy that's beloved. The people that I know that that know him personally have gone, this guy rocks. He's just a pleasure to be around. And there's a reason that he was given all these opportunities. One, because second generation wrestler, they clearly see marketability with him as they should. But also, He's just crossed these little checkpoints along the way that make you have faith in him. And it's so nice to see in this match, like we said at the top, just a big seal of approval. You know, I want to talk about this finishing stretch where Strong Machine J with the referee down hits a dragon suplex on Shu and Skywalker. Yagi crawls for the pin, but he's injured. One, two. It's a very de uh, slow, deliberate count. Skywalker kicks out. The machine suplex connects with Shun Skywalker. It's the first time anybody kicks out of that move. And I love how Strong Machine J went for it again. The second time he goes for it, Shun Skywalker steps on his foot. They basically twirl around a little bit, counter after counter after counter. And before he can hit a second machine suplex, Strong Machine, or I'm sorry, Shun Skywalker hits him in the jackknife, rolls him up, wins the match. It is a, a finish that protected Strong Machine J. It was an on-brand finish for Shun Skywalker. I love that it was a flash pin, but it didn't feel dirty. It didn't totally take the wind out of everybody's sails. Just a brilliant finish to a very good, not great for me. I went three and three quarters. Very good, not great match. But one of those matches that just made me feel so excited about the future of Strong Machine J. Yeah, I was four flat. I The, the thing I loved about like the spinning around is that when Strong Machine J beat him the first time, he completely discombobulated him during Raid de Parejas. And he did that by like spinning him around and kind of getting him in a place where it's like, oh, 
now I caught you and it's a suplex one. So him going to that was, I thought was a neat little flourish that really kind of added a lot. And it made like the, the anticipation is like, Oh, is he, he's going for it. When can strong machine J get in there? Oh wait. Now Shun managed to just shoot, shoot low flip over. And Jay on commentary brought up the fact that prime zone, which is something that like, I did not know this about prime zone was Shun was doing five minute challenges and, the closest he came to win a five minute challenge back in 2017 was from this jackknife cradle. So it was nice to kind of see that. And it's, and it's something that like you compare and contrast that with Kai and the authorized Kanosuke clutch and the way that he was kind of sleezing his way out of it. No, this felt completely deserved that it was like, Oh, Shun knew that this was something that he got hit with again. He's already lost to this move before two in a row. And that's it quickest way for him to get out of there because it's not like, he was going to hit the Ashla. He was going to bring that back out for this. Like, it just made perfect sense here. And it made Strong Machine J look strong, I would say, in defeat. Last week, we went through all of the Champion Gate and Osaka main events since they started doing this as a yearly tradition, which, which goes back to 2012. And we saw a transition in this event from, you know, it being Shima versus Yoshino and Shingo versus Susumu, some of these big-time matchups to this new era 2018 onwards where it was you know mochizuki versus ben k and then Pac versus skywalker doi versus asumu a bit of an outlier here and then 2021 shun versus ashita in 2022 kai versus uh kai versus shimizu this has become a proving ground event and in the same way that ben k came out of uh this weekend better in 2018 and shun skywalker did in 2019 and kaito ashita did in 2021 if only ashita had been able to stick that landing and even Shimizu, to some degree, came out better last year. Strong Machine J did this year. So I think this is an event that we're going to look back on very fondly. You know, I asked you the question earlier, do you think Strong Machine J will ever be a Dreamgate champion? And, and, and I still lean no, ultimately. But I think if you asked me in 2019 after the Pac versus Skywalker match, will Shun Skywalker ever be a Dreamgate champion? I, I think I would have said, well... I know he'll be a great Bravegate champion. You know, I'm I'm not sure about him being a Dreamgate champion, let alone now as we stand four years later, a two-time Dreamgate champion and the best character in wrestling. You know, I, I did not see any of that coming. So perhaps the future is even brighter than I think for Strong Machine J, but even as it stood, a tremendous weekend for him. Before we move on to anything else, you want to talk about attendance really quick this weekend? Yeah, let's hit on it, Case. I know that you were thinking 550, 650. Allegedly, they sh they sold every seat they had, but it was 450, and let me pull up the and 528. So it was under what you were expecting. Do you see? Do you see that being down at all? Oh, well, I did not see uh, they sold every ticket on that second night. Where where do you see that at? Oh, no. It, on commentary, they said that they were selling every ticket. Oh, okay. Well, then, uh, you know, that's... That, that was on night one, though. That was on night one. Night two, I did not hear that. But for night one, 450 was apparently all the tickets they had allotted. Interesting. You know, th this is something we'll kind of talk about when we shift back to Cork in a little bit. But I, I found analyzing COVID attendance from 2021 onwards to be much easier than analyzing attendance in its current form. Because a Cork and sellout is now being recognized as 1300, which is, you know, I have no reason to believe that that's suspicious in any way you know the all-star show the all-star junior show did just over 1300 the last two fantastic mania shows did just over 1300 and those were super no vacancy full houses the weird thing is for you know people that might not remember pre-pandemic but mike and i really recognized 1800 as the legitimate true cork and hall sellout so there's still restrictions and i've got to talk to people that know more than i do about kind of where we're at in terms of filling these buildings I know I was a little high in my prediction last week, but I still think we have to look at these as good numbers. 455 for the first night. That is up big over 383 from night one last year, which had Daya versus Fujiwara in the Brave Gate and the original gold class trio, Kaito Ishida, Coach Minora, and Naruki Doi winning the Triangle Gate belts from Jackie Funky, Kamei KZ, and Yuti in the main event. 
This year, the 455 for Jason Lee versus Minarita in the new gold class trio of Ben K, BB Hulk, and Coach Menor versus M3K. And then night two, 528 this year uh, for Shimizu and KZ versus Kakuta and Yoshioka and Skywalker versus Strong Machine J. Last year, they did 510 for D Courage versus Zebrats versus Eita and Yosuke Santa Maria for the Twin Gate and Kai versus Shimizu for the Dream Gate. So up year over year, and in the current climate of a decimated scene of a very poor Japanese wrestling economy, you just have to keep on building on what you did the year before, and Dragon Gate did that. And especially with the information they sold every ticket available on night one, that has to be looked at as a huge win. Yeah, and to my knowledge, like, yes, noise is completely lifted, but I think that, and... And it's, uh, my working assumption has been that they announced it, but they weren't able to kind of change ticket seating charts yet. It, it was like they already sold these tickets and you're not going to tell someone, well, now you're sitting here because they've already planned for that. So I'm of the belief that tickets that were on sale after they said uh, cheering is back, the restrictions, whatever. I feel like then that from there, that's when we could really compare it to previous year because – 1380 is not what they were claiming as a super no vacancy full house even last year because there were some 14 there were some shows that are getting close to 1500 in there so i think it is back to how the allotment was and how the seating charts were when they announced that cheering was back they were not able to cheer to really change that if that makes sense yeah yeah that that's uh that thank you for sort of illuminating that that all makes sense and i just had to put that together in my head yeah, at least that's my read on the situation and from talking to others who kind of study uh, Japanese wrestling and, and work within it, that that's the assumption that I've been given with that. But I, I look at these both as two positive numbers, you know, I mean, like, as you said, year over year, that's really where it is the tell. And you look at the the championship matches and it's not like that, because like, last year of Shimizu, Shimizu's from Osaka. You had that benefit there, even though it was Kai in that main event for night two. Whereas in this case, you have you have you have Shun Skywalker, who's not from the town. You have uh, Strong Machine J, first title challenge, not from Osaka. That there were less training wheels, I would say, for night two this year. Whereas last year, night one, you know, you had Nuruki Doi in that main event. You at that point, we should have had our red flags up about Nuruki Doi's drawing in Dragon Gate. To be honest. Yeah, yeah, God, that that first Champion Gate show last year, and I, I hold 2022 Champion Gate in such high esteem because the four title matches were great, but what what an odd show outside of that. You know, Yoshioka versus SB Kento, which ends in a DQ, a four-minute Diamante and Hyo versus A-10 Maria match, and that original Gold Clash trio, which, you know, we're, we're still too close from it to wax poetically about it, but... As this podcast continues to grow in a few years, Mike, we're going to have to revisit just simply gold class in 2022 and the bizarre existence that it was, because I don't think there's ever been a unit that has undergone more change and more highs and lows than a single unit did the way they did last year. Yeah, I feel like that's where we need to get the oral history of that, along with the oral history of over generation. I oh, feel like God, that oh, is that are... is that is that next week? Are we gonna? Do, we've got a free week next week. No <laughs> big shows to review. Oh God, I don't, it, I don't want to do that. It, it, it's either that or remember that guy marathon edition where I keep on peppering you with random people to see like, hey, case, do you r- remember random people in UD06? Ugh, no, I don't. I don't <laughs> like that. Brian you know, ne- Lee, and not that Brian Lee that you're thinking of. Next week is Michinoku Pro's 30th anniversary. Maybe we maybe we just do something fun and talk Michinoku Pro instead of Over Generation. I mean, I would look for anything other than talking about Over Generation. Well, Case, you, you alluded to uh, how on the first night it was, uh, or on the second night, it was the test for uh, Strong Machine J. On the first night, I think the big story coming out of Champion Gate from night one, and also one of the bigger stories of the week, Jason Lee becomes the 47th Open the Brave Gate champion, defeating Minorita in Minorita's first defense with a maximum driver at at 1149. 
and adding his list to foreigners who have held the Open the Brave Gate title. And Jason pointed this out on Twitter. Matt Seidel, Pack, Ricochet, Flamita. Now Jason Lee is the fifth. I've said for two years now, you know, the, the first time I made this comment was after Dead or Alive 2021 when I, I took a look at the, the Japanese junior heavyweight scene, which I got a good look at last week. And again, you can be, read my review of the All-Star Junior Wrestling Festival over at voiceofwrestling.com. I got a good look at the Japanese junior heavyweight scene this past week. And much like the conclusion I came to in 2021, I think Jason Lee's the best junior heavyweight in the world. You know, there were there were a lot of good wrestlers on that cork and show. I think Fujita Junior Hayato is still one of the best juniors in the world. I think Hiromu, uh, despite the fact that he is certainly not the wrestler that he once was, I think he's very good. I, I think Amakusa is very good in his new gimmick. I, I don't think anybody's on the level of Jason Lee. And I I don't know if he's ever gonna get the credit he deserves. You know, the thing that would help is obviously coming to America, at least in our bubble for him to get that recognition, you know, and if I was going to build any sort of Dragon Gate six man for an American audience, I think it would have to include him just because I I trust him to keep the wheels on just in case anything would go wrong. But this match with Minorita second best match of the weekend for me, just a, a beautiful display of pro wrestling. You know, the thing that we come to expect from, from Jason Lee and the thing that quite frankly, we've come to expect from Minorita is consistent, quality all the time and now jason lee i hope he has a chance to have a pock like bravegate run you know i i i don't know how long this reign will go you know under the current booking regime that we've seen it's a lot of quick title runs you know triangle gate belt changed hands every defense for most of last year twin gate belt has bounced around quite a bit there's been a lot of bravegate champions over the last two years this is the time to slow things down and let Jason Lee run through this roster. I have a list of wrestlers I would like to see him wrestle. We can get to that in a second. But I want this to be the Pac in 2011, Flamita in 2014, Kaito Ishida in 2020. I want it to be that level of open the Brave Gate run, and I know he has the talent to do it. It's a matter of the opportunity. Yeah, and you look at the possible opponents, and not to jump to your list, immediately no please and it's really he is someone that i look very much like that that pac run in 2011 where pac other than like setting up ricochet was having these matches with all comers throughout the roster and i feel like that the brave gate kind of gets like this this palate cleanser you have hyo's heel shenanigans into minorita kind of getting like the look he's won it and then he loses in his first defense because, of course, he was. And then that kind of like doing all of that for the last, uh, well, since uh, Ultimo's 35 anniversary show. So since last July, now you really have like an open book here that like, yes, Dragon Kid has faced Hio recently at Gita Destiny of last year. But Dragon Kid versus Jason Lee in my books is still like a viable match like you don't have to like send him down for his turn there there's just a lot of opportunities here but the the match itself like really in a lot of ways i feel like shows that jason lee and minorita who was awesome in this match as well like that total world frank frank and our flatliner was one of the nastiest things oh all weekend. fantastic just, just incredible stuff you see just like every little bit of the game in both these wrestlers and yeah minorita i know that like the with the character we're going to see it we we saw the changes with him after losing the belt but we got to see like as like a one-year project minorita like come to full fruition within like the last few months and that has been such a fun thing to see as well that yeah i ended up being only four flat on this match mainly because of how shorter was and there was it, it it was very much how i'd want to do each spot throughout it it's like this is how i imagine it would go and that's not a detriment it just was what how i kind of expected the match to go and it was very much how i wanted it to go and i enjoyed that for that i went four and a quarter on this you know to, to go to your point of dran kid just wrestled heel for the brave gate the vibes 
uh, no pun intended, between a Hyo Bravegate run and a Jason Lee Bravegate run could not be more different. I think the deck reshuffles here. I think it's a clean reset, and anybody uh, is fair game at this point. Hyo included, Minorita included, Dragon Kid included, whoever else wrestled for the belt last year. I, I want them all to come Jason Lee's way. You know, Pox run was over a year long. 11 successful defenses, you know, Kness, Dragon Kid, Yamato, Naoki Tanizaki, Ricochet twice, Akira Tozawa, uh, Naruki Doi, Genki Horiguchi, all uh, fell to Pac in that run before he eventually lost it to Ricochet. And the names that I could come up with, the possible Brave Gate contenders, look a little bit like this. I've got Dragon Kid number one, and then Kagatora. Rio Fuda, Kaito Nagano, La Estrella, if he chooses to come back to Japan, Jackie Funky Kame, Hyo, Ishin, Minorita, Dragon Daya, Mochizuki Jr., and if we really want to have some fun, if we really want to make this interesting, Ata. Yeah, there's just, it's an interesting place where that under 83 kilos division is right now because we have some guys that just out and out cannot be in this division anymore where that really was not a case for like four or five years there i think yeah it feels it feels thin and i don't know why that is because that's 10 names right there that could have a brave gate match tomorrow if they wanted to and that's not mentioning sb kento or takuma fujiwara both of whom i left off this list because I assume when they come back, and we can talk about a possible return date for them in just a minute, they'll either be in the Twin Gate division or they will be in the main event scene and surpassing the Brave Gate division. I I hope that's the case for them. I think they have a special circumstance here where they're going to leapfrog past that Brave Gate belt once they return and go straight to the uh, the main event scene. But you could throw those guys in there as well. But I, I don't know. Do you have the same thought process I do where for some reason, even if it's not true, this division feels a little thin right now? I think it's just the fact that everything with like Hyo and Minorita was such a palate cleanser that we kind of were like, oh, well, who can defend it? Who we can defend it against when that's really not the case? Like, like you look into it, I mean, like Yosuke Samaria could be on that list just as easily. So, you know, like there's there's enough people that you could just easily say, like, because you, if you have Kakator on that list case, you could have Yosuke on there as well. Let's be honest here. I guess having a roster where you have a few guys other than, say, Cyber Kong that no longer qualify for the Brave Gate division is the jarring thing there where, you know, Shun is too big and Diamante is too big and even Kato's too big and Nishikawa, when he comes back, he'll be too big. It, the rosters, both in terms of size, in terms of quantity and muscle mass, is just bigger than it has been possibly ever. Yeah, and I think like that is kind of coloring it. Uh, I the the one thing that you, one person you left off that list because if you look at what happened in the opener in night two is Manorita is not done with Jason Lee. Yes, like, you're, you're you're absolutely right. So, so we could very easily, and I think that might be possible. We'll see how things are happening on the uh, the loop this week. And I would would you be surprised if we get a quick uh, run back at Wakiyama because I'm looking at like what could be at Wakayama, and especially considering that there will be people it'll be harder to set up Wakayama than usual with the uh, folks in Singapore this weekend but I, I I could see them do it going straight back to this program for that kind of thing and I feel like that there's life enough in this program that you can have an immediate rematch when that's something that it never happens in Dragon Gate I think we're going to get the rematch this month, and there's three different shows they can do it on. You've got March 18th this next Saturday, which is Momo again in Wakayama. You've got the next day in Nagoya at the International Conference Center, which listeners of this show know that is a big building for Dragon Gate. That is a venue that they outdraw everybody outside of New Japan in, in a pretty healthy way. And then two days later in Kobe Sambo Hall is a national holiday in Japan. It's Vernal Equinox Day. They've got Sambo Hall there. That could very easily headline a Kobe show if they need it to. Yeah, so uh, it, it is something where, yes, like as as you laid out, it does feel like it's a thinner roster at that division at this point. But when you like think about it a little bit, I feel like that there's such a fun path forward for Jason Lee. And I something that we really should touch on, and we kind of we have we have addressed this a lot in the past is where this now puts Jason amongst foreigners in Dragon Gate. Because to me, maybe this is recency bias. I think he's now on that Mount Rushmore. 
oh, I mean, I, I think he, I think he has to be, and I, and I think he was before this match, but I, I think he moved up a spot because I don't know where you stand on this. I think you have to have Pac number one, Ricochet right. number two, mm-hmm. and then I would have Jason Lee at three. I am leaning to the, him at three because then you're talking about Seidel or Jack, and to be honest, Jack feels like a lifetime ago like a literal lifetime ago jack evans and same thing with matt seidel like i feel like it comes with this like the person who the that i feel like is getting nudged off is flamita like long term because i feel like diamante is making a his own claim there and i didn't even think about diamante yeah like that's the thing like when we like we dial it down now jason and I would say, I mean, he's three belts to becoming a a Grand Slam winner, if you think about it. And there's only two other foreigners who did that, and that is Pac and Ricochet. Okay, let's circle back to Jason because I, I I'm not quite done with his legacy yet. But I so if we're if we're in agreement that it's Pac, Ricochet, Jason Lee, you, would you have Seidel over Flamita? I think Flamita is still four, but barely over Diamante at this point. I thought about this a lot today, Flamita versus Seidel, because I've been watching a lot of 2006 Drangate recently. There's some stuff that uh, I've come across that I've never seen before. And if you turn on 2006 Infinity, there is so much Matt Seidel there. And a larger talking point of mine, both in the context of Drangate and in the context of greater wrestling, is... You guys, I think I think we forgot how good Matt Seidel was for a very long period of time. Just just a marvelous professional wrestler who was kind of everything I want out of a white meat baby face. And Seidel in the context of Dragon Gate, you know, Brave Gate champion, Triangle Gate champion, left really as the Twin Gate belts were getting formed when he came back in 2014 and 2015 he was just doing the teamwork alongside ricochet never really had a chance to wrestle for the twin gate belts and never had a chance to wrestle for the dream gate belt either i think people underrate him just because of recency bias but i still give flamita the nose here you know flamita was so exciting for such a long time he has a little bit more longevity than people realize you know really 2014 to 2019 and so i side with him in that fourth spot right now yeah, and it Seidel is such an interesting one because Seidel kind of became like like he for those who don't know, Seidel came not as a part of the Ring of Honor relationship, but right afterwards because originally Shima wanted Jack, and Jack eventually and Japan kind of ran its course, and a lot of what they wanted to do with Jack, they ended up going with Matt Seidel who fit in much much better like he was such an integral part of the company i mean member of typhoon member of just uh, blood generation blood generation i mean he would have been probably front and foremost in world one if he stuck around for another year well that's that's the thing i mean the the lineage is you know evans and seidel are in the company at the same time but the focus turns to seidel when he comes in and so it seemed like anything they had planned for jack went to Seidel, and then once Seidel left, Pac is his literal replacement. I mean, the you know, the crystal ball, the alternate timeline of what happens if Matt Seidel doesn't sign with the WWE? It, it's like you said, he becomes a kingpin in World 1. You know, everything that he did, Pac also did, and, you know, Seidel would have had that lengthy Bravegate run. Seidel, if he stuck around, might have been a Dreamgate champion. It, it's very realistic or very attainable to look at what his future would have been had he not left. He just happened to leave and Pac was in the perfect place at the perfect time. And it kind of became like a domino effect that like (laughs) from Evans to Seidel to Pac to Ricochet, like almost like a literal handing the baton in that case. Yeah, completely. And I think for like those reasons, like I... Flamita is such an interesting case because he... Well, like his legacy is pretty much etched in stone in Dragon Gate at this point. I I feel like we can both say like he's not going to be adding to it. No, like, so. I mean, I look. I wish he'd come back. I I don't remember if I was. I think I was talking about this on the I, on the show. I don't remember if I was texting somebody about this or talking about this on the air. I really wish 
the big lucha relationship was with Drangate and not Glee. It's frustrating because I think a lot of those guys can work. And I think getting Flamita and Bandito and then obviously Commander in the fold would do a lot of th- this company's in very good shape. Drangy doesn't need them, but I would like them here. It would have made a lot of sense, both like historically and then also creatively. So, yeah, no, I'm totally with you there. I mean, because Bandito, Ban- Bandito has an interesting legacy here. You know, mm-hmm. he only spent a year in Dragon Gate, but. In the same way that Flamita's entire career was made off of basically one match with Susumu Yokosuka, Bandito's entire career was made off of the Bandito Flamita versus the Rascals match in January of 2018. Uh, when Bandito got booked in Dragon Gate, I had to reach out to Rob Viper and Cubs fan. I go, who is this guy? He was not a known entity. He was coming into Dragon Gate as Flamita's friend. And that Rascals versus Flamita and Bandito match got gift it went viral they got into pwg and the rest is history but bandito's another one of these guys i don't know if people realize that now because he's done so well for himself i mean i was at an indie show two years ago where bandito was treated like a jesus-like figure he's done so well for himself i don't know if people realize the origins of that but his career was owed to dragon gate and arguably he was the last person who went to dragon gate and then burst out immediately right after Yes, and, and had he stayed, I think he would have been at the very least a Champion Gate in Osaka Dream Gate challenger. He would have been that level of guy because the next year, you know, 2019, he's in that Super Juniors tournament and he's phenomenal. And had the pandemic not happened, I think New Japan would have used him a lot more. Now he's in Gleet, which, you know, some days I think that's a good thing. Some days I think that's a bad thing. I don't really know, but. He's he's probably the biggest asterisk of the Mount Rushmore foreigners list as what would have been Dito's career looked like had he stayed. I think a similar question can be asked about Uha Nation and if he had another year or two in Dragon Gate, what would his career look like? But I feel pretty confident at this point saying it's Pac and then a gap and then Ricochet and then a gap and then Jason Lee and then a gap and then, you know, some combination of Flamita, Seidel, Diamante, but I give Flamita the edge. Yeah, no, I I think I'm with you, though. I think I would do Seidel over Flamita at this point, or Diamante over the three of them at this point. Uh, The match itself, we really didn't get a chance to, haven't talked about the Brave Gate change. Uh, Jason Lee has become one of the heaviest hitters in the company, and it's really kind of brutal seeing the way he throws elbow strikes. It's really cool. It's phenomenal, but it's something I was like, Jason, uh, you, you could probably take 10% off that and it would still be as amazing as it is. But instead, it looks like he starches people and he got Minarita a couple times in this match. Yeah, I like that Jason Lee's adopted this and then Coach Minora tried to steal his thunder on the second night in Osaka. And when Ho-Ho Loon got back to the commentary table, he was like, ah, that elbow, Minora hit the shit out of me. That's <laughs> so good. <laughs> selling it at, selling it for like two matches after he came I, back. I don't know if he was selling that one. I think he took the full <laughs> force of a Coach Minora elbow and he was feeling it two matches later. But your, your note here is exactly my note here. It, much like the finish of the Dreamgate match and, and where it just felt so satisfying. You could sit back and go, God, that's good pro wrestling. The now month and a half long stretch, really starting with that Yoshiki Kato match where Jason Lee is just hitting guys in the face as hard as he can. What a phenomenal turn of events, and it gives him, you know, the maximum driver. It gives him Lee's wings, that Kimura lock, and then it gives him this big forearm, which really sets him up for these finishing stretches. He's such a dynamic wrestler in general, but now his finishing stretches, he has so many different things to turn to. It's all super exciting. Yeah, it's an absolute blast to talk about. Well, Case, he, you, you talked about why Ho-Ho wasn't able to be immediately there on night two however we got a special commentator it was daiki yanagiuchi who debuted that thursday against don fuji and what has become a very scintillating kind of storyline happening class of 2022 are having their gut checks this week started with the debut with of uh, daiki yanagiuchi at cork and against don fuji and then continuing throughout champion gate weekend it's it's one of my my favorite things in a wrestling case. There's few things that I enjoy more than a veteran 
being the crap out of a rookie, the rookie trying to summon everything they have in them and dish it back in. We're starting to get that in spades in Dragon Gate, and it started with this debut match for Daiki Yanagiuchi. You know, there's a lot of things I want to talk about with the the current future class. So that is going to be Mochizuki Jr., Kaito Nagano, Yoshiki Kato, uh, to some degree, Takuma Nishikawa, who's out in Japan, and then Daiki Yanaguchi, who just debuted this past week. Ho-Ho Loon, speaking of him, he made a comment. He made it in the Dreamgate match, but I think it's relevant here. There's a, there's a few different spots that I could have slotted this in. I want to be sure to bring this up. I think I'm going to talk about it in terms of the rookies. And, you know, I think anybody listening, anybody with any sort of interest in Dragon Gate, the beautiful thing with this promotion is we all we all like it, and I think a lot of us like it for different reasons. And for some people, it's the pageantry. For some people, it's the stories they tell. For some people, they think it's, you know, it, it's kick-ass matches. They can fill a spreadsheet with it. It's great. The thing that interests me most when I talk to people that have worked in or around this promotion is I think these wrestlers are wired differently. And I simply, when I watch when I watch the in-ring action, yes, it's great, but I feel like I'm watching something truly different, something truly removed from the rest of the wrestling world. And Ho-Ho said something so interesting in the Dreamgate match. They were talking about how uh, when he went to America, he didn't realize that he had to slow down until he got there. You know, Jay was saying... Hey, when you go there, you know, you're gonna have to slow down. Not everybody works at the Dragon Gate pace. And Ho-Ho kind of blew him off. I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And then Ho-Ho got there and realized, oh, no one works at the Dragon Gate pace. These wrestlers in Dragon Gate are all built differently. Maybe he was talking about this actually during uh, Jason Lee versus Minarita. I think it was the Brave Gate match, not the Dream Gate match. But the point still stands. Just how these wrestlers are wired differently and talented in a way that is hard to comprehend unless you soak yourself into the fabric of this promotion. And what we see with these young wrestlers is, Mike, I think we're looking at at the pinnacle of this. And I said this about six months ago, and I think it's truer now than it was then. I think we're looking at one of the greatest rookie classes in the history of professional wrestling. And it's something that you really have to look at, like, three musketeers that, that that's what i went back to was we have to yeah. talk about 80s new japan there's not a dojo over a year and a half two-year period since hashimoto and muto and chono that i can remember this many young wrestlers being so exciting and if that sounds preposterous to you it's because you're not paying attention and i don't want to go into this redundant fucking volcan mochizuki jr discussion which is brought to you by jr goldberg who has never had an interesting thing to say in his entire life he's a professional pessimist he's a fucking asshole i do not care for him and he parachuted into a conversation in which he had no business being a part of because he's never seen mochizuki jr wrestle that's not the point of this discussion but i do have to get that off my chest the point is for the people that are plugged in for the people that pay attention and for the people that actually want to have a a discussion god forbid on stuff that they care about this is one of the greatest rookie classes in the history of professional wrestling. And it's something that, I mean, immediately compared to like class of 2020 for Dragon Gate, there were some growing pains with that class. When And then you look at uh, future 2021 and how many people have come through it. You The, the, the thing that like Daiki introduces that just like the rest of the class like was able to have for different reasons was an immediate connection in Cork and Hall. Like, and it could be that he's very much going to be a one building guy that Tokyo loves him because he's from Tokyo and he worked there and they kind of go like, Hey, this is the kid that we've seen for so long. And now he's wrestling. That's really cool. But the talent and just like the way that he wrestled, at least in that match was phenomenal. And a lot of this, I'd say for this week, we have to give our, roses as well to don fuji but when you look at this class and you look at the different things that they offer you have mochizuki jr son of one of the five greatest wrestlers of all time when you have yoshiki kato who is built different and has net and somehow is able to look act like the meanest person possible but also suddenly like turn on like the uh, the, the your matinee idol charm 
you have Kaito Nagano, brother of a J League soccer player who's able to do certain things flying that should not be able to happen. And, and that's even to and that's even leaving out the giant question mark known as Nishikawa. There's just such a variety here that like if you need evidence that the dojo in Kobe is the greatest wrestling school in operation today, just look at the variety of this class because you have so many different aspects of pro wrestling that are done at the highest level from people who are, have been in the business as little as a week. Yeah. I mean, there, there's nothing comparable, you know, look at the nightmare factory. I, I think there's a lot of guys with potential there, but I don't think anybody has really been able to find it in a way that I was hoping for. And I still have a ton of, a ton of stock in Nick Camaretto. And I don't know if that's going to happen. The performance center has been open 10 years and they haven't produced anybody worthwhile. New Japan has a lot of guys. New Japan has a lot of bodies and, I, you know, I do a podcast with you, Mike, I, you know, you, you rail against their system more than anybody I know. And I think you're justified in that new Japan for as, as bright as their future might be for as talented as their young boys are. They don't seem to have that diversity that Dragon Gate has, or at least they're not able to show it. And as I always go to, you know, all Japan has, you know, has one kid who I think will get st uh, stolen by new Japan at some point. And Noah has nobody. And Noah's really never had anybody with you know, the exception of Nakajima, who wasn't really theirs. These dojos, they, they would kill for talent like this. I always go back to Rio Fuda. He's the worst guy of this era of young wrestlers. And he would be the best guy if he left and went to all Japan, Noah or DDT tomorrow in terms of their young wrestlers. It's, it's amazing. The quality they put out in Yanaguchi. I mean, what what a phenomenal opening match. You were a little bit higher on it than I was. You went four stars. I went three and a half. But it is just everything you would want from a guy who is trying to endear himself to his hometown audience. He takes a beating, and then he fights back. And Cork and Hall chants his name in his first match ever. He has that wild Tope Suicida, which looks so good. In the end, it looks like just for a brief second, he might have enough to get past Don Fuji. And then Don Fuji reminded us who he is, and he nearly broke his back uh, with a uh, with a Boston Crab there and ended the match. Just phenomenal stuff. Yeah, and I wrote it in my review, like with how the Dragon System is and how this era of the Dojo and Kobe is. This could be a fleeting thing. I mean, he had an uphill climb, not completely as difficult as your your Shoya Sato's, but I mean. He faced rejection, he faced injury, and he came through and did this. Like, him getting to this point and having this kind of match, if that's it, then how do you remember this match along the same lines of 12-1, 2016, and Katsumi Takashima, someone who never wrestled on TV again after that match? Like, you have, like, this thing that at least for a moment, he had his hometown venue, the place he worked at, cheer for him chant his name and then don fuji like that i i fully believe that there's no one who does this style of match as well as don fuji he gets it and he uh, and it's not just an enjoyment of being the crap out of young wrestlers case it is knowing like okay i can eat shit i can do xyz i know that daiki we he's going to have certain things that i need to do for him to make it work and there's no one better at knowing these things and applying it as don fuji Mr. Spongeman, Mr. Let Corporation, I, I really hope you hear this message. I, I would like to personally fund a match uh, that, that your, your company can present. A five-on-five -five tag of Masaki Mochizuki, Don Fuji, Dragon Kid, Yamato, and Naruki Doi versus Ryo Fuda, Kaito Nagano, Yoshiki Kato, Daiki Yanigiuchi, and Mochizuki Jr., if we could run back the, the closest we can get to 12 1 16, which was, you know, Shima, Gamma, Fuji, Mochizuki, and Dragon Kid versus, let me see if I can nail all these rookies. It was Hyo, Yuki, Yoshi, Yuki Yoshioka in his debut match, Katsumi Takashima in his debut match, Shun Skywalker and Ben K. If we can run that back with the 2023 version, that'd be greatly appreciated. Yeah, that's got to get that to be a match of the week sometime. Yeah, yeah. Angry two one six. If you're listening, why don't you throw up twelve one sixteen in the uh, Voices of Wrestling Discord <laughs> at some point? That'd be greatly appreciated. But look, I, I mean, th these kids are unbelievable. I, I completely echo your sentiments on his debut match, and then it continues into the weekend in Osaka, 
where you see Mochi Fuji versus Nagano and Kato, a match that I went four stars on just because it was it was everything that you would want it to be. You know, these rookies are so interesting, and I love what they've done with Nagano and Kato, whereas you saw the first iteration of these future kids get beat like a drum, you know, Takuma Fujiwara in particular. He's never won a match in Japan. And then you see, you know, they give Kato a win early, and then they give Nagano a win right after that. And now there's this real possibility in every match they go into, whether it's with Yamato or it's with Punch Tamanaga, these kids could win anything, and it seems realistic, and it seems possible. They do a great job of always selling that possibility. In the match with Mochi Fuji, they ended up losing. I wouldn't have been surprised at all if they won. It would have been a great moment had they won, and it was a great moment the way they got their ass kicked and lost. Yeah, and the fact that, you know, building up of these wins that Kato and Nakano have gotten, and the fact that Don Fuji, who busted out the Hime, that's his name for the Boston Crab, against Daiki on Thursday, he has to resort to the Gato Clutch, which is a move that whenever he does that, that is not like a standard flash pin. That's a desperation pin from him. And the fact that he had to do it on Kaito Nagano, who he, I am willing to guess if he's not twice his weight, he's close to that. But like this match that happened on night on night one, it just was something where you, you see Don Fuji doing a head scissors and then two minutes later punching a guy in the mouth. It has levels, case. And yeah, I, I was maybe a shade lower than you on that, but it was something that, it is fascinating to see with Mochi Fuji now kind of coming back as we want to talk a little bit about the unit landscape. We'll talk about that in a minute. We're going to case have to come to terms and maybe sooner than we expected. The first ever father son match in Dragon Gate history might be uh, in the offering soon. It certainly feels like it's coming. You know, it's one of those deals. Mochizuki Jr. only continues to get better and, you know, a friend of the show, Alan Forel, made the point. We, we might be looking at the single best rookie year ever. And I, I was so early in saying that about Fujiwara. And I think that's true. And, I, you know, I, I, I think some people fell off the Fujiwara bandwagon when he met, went to Mexico. But for me, it, it, only made, it only made me appreciate him more because he went to Mexico and and just seamlessly transitioned in this way that was almost spooky. Like he showed up in DTU and big Lucha. And it was like, it was like he trained and had been living there for five years. It was just bizarre. I, I've never seen anybody adapt the way that he did. So it really made me appreciate him even more. Mochizuki jr. Has stayed home this entire year in dragon gate. You know, June will mark 12 months of, uh, since his debut, he's been great in the ring. He's been great in the stories they've told with him. He's performed angles. He has this charisma, this way that he carries himself that makes him seem far beyond, you know, a man in his young 20s. He comes across like legitimate professional, a guy that can carry the company on his back in the future. I don't know. I don't know what more you could want. He's been in big positions and he's delivered. He's been in opening matches and he's delivered. He's had great matches for the sake of having great matches. He's been able to have great angles to further along stories. He's been a draw, as we talked about over the summer months. You know, that Ishin versus Mochizuki Jr. story that they really kept strong in Tokyo. Uh, we talked to people who are going, you know, I'm I'm buying a ticket to see that. I'm invested in this story. I don't know what more you could want from him. And Kurt Angle, Jun Akiyama, Matt Riddle, whoever you want, I, I don't know who's done more than him. Yeah, it's interesting to see like the, the difference between him and Fujiwara. I think the thing is, is that you watch Fujiwara and you're like, oh, this guy, I think it was Striga who said this, looks like he's the, he's done nothing on this earth but pro wrestling. Like, that's what his purpose is. Yeah, I was like, that at, was a great, I, I remember that Striga tweet. That was a great point. Yeah, fantastic tweet. Whereas you look at Mochizuki Jr. And you're like, oh, he was born to do this. It's not like that this person's existence is purely to pro wrestling this is someone that is you know the son of one of the two uh greatest entering wrestlers in dragon system history of course he's going to be this way but the thing that he has that fujiwara had does not have or does not seem to have that we're starting to pick up more in mexico maybe because he was put an opportunity you put mochizuki jr in any position case i've been hammering this for months he, this kid 
does not strike out. He's going to put wood on the ball. He's going to get on base. Case, do you, can you tell I'm excited about the World Baseball Classic starting up tonight? Oh, you, you and me both, brother. But, you know, we, we, have, we have an example of Mochizuki Jr. That, that didn't work, and it's not him specifically, but there's not a ton of difference between him and Strong Machine J in the way they were presented in their first few months. The difference is Strong Machine J in his original form was a one trick pony. And, and by the time the Strong Machine Army, you know, he debuted April of 2019 and they won the belts at World 2019, a three month gap in between his debut and his first title win. And by the time they had the belts, we had seen it all. You know, we knew what that act was going to be. And I don't know where you stand, but I know I was sick of it. And I, I, I don't remember you being super into that at that point. And we saw him slowly slide down the card. And like we talked about, you know, 2020 was a rough year for Strong Machine J. We came on this podcast and wondered if if he had a future in this company or if he'd be better off elsewhere because of his name. And he turned things around. The difference is with Mochizuki Jr., there's been no there's been no downside. There's been no plummet down the card. He just continues to get better and better and better. And he's in big spot after big spot after big spot. And he's a, a a guy who comes across like a main event wrestler every time he's given the opportunity to be. Yeah, and it's something that, like, the big thing is the second chapter case. We talk about it a lot, but being able to see, like, you had your introductory storyline where everything's protecting you and all of this. What happens next? And they maybe it is that it was hard to figure out how to onboard after Strong Machine J, like, onboard him into being his own person. You know, not being like the tribute act with his father's old manager coming out. <laughs> like, I think that was the thing that really turned me off the Strong Machine Army was the uh, Shogun K.Y. Wakamatsu every time. You know, I look, I have nothing bad to say about K.Y. Wakamatsu. You're going to have to fight that battle on your own. He was so old. He or, was, that was an old guy who felt like an old guy. Right. Was, so know, old. He was really old. <laughs> Could be Jay's grandfather. <laughs> but. You know, you, you talk about that, the, the transition out of Strong Machine Army and how Jay really struggled with that. I, I don't know where you stand, but I have no doubt that whenever they, they pull the trigger and move away from M3K, and I would assume that's with Junior turning heel on his dad, do you know how exciting a Mochizuki Junior heel turn sounds? And that's not something that I want anytime soon. I think M3K has a ton of juice left in them, if anything, just for the two-on-two -two Mochizuki and Mochizuki tags. But... Oh my God, can you imagine him as a heel right now? The the shit-kicking grins that he would get on his face, the way he would torture a Kaito Nagano or a Ryo Fuda, it, it would be golden. And I think he could transition to that no problem. Oh yeah, no, it's it's very clear that... And, and there, what, what, there could have been a very easy way to make him 3K a overwhelming heel act, you know? Like, like really play up the fact that he is daddy's boy, you know? But now, like, the idea of him turning against his father, then you have the whole idea about maybe him and Ishin get on the same page again. Well, it certainly seems like they are going to be linked, and we can't forget about the three-way between Ishin and Junior and Strong Machine J. Was that at final gate? No, that was at Gate of Origin that they did that, right? That three-way? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, that look, don't forget about that. K keep that in your back pocket just as things go on and these units change. At some point, I, I would assume that we're going to get those three in a unit doing that thing, doing this second generation thing all with one another. I'm with you on that. I, it just seems like that that has a lot of legs to it if they decided to do that. And you know, we've talked a little bit about natural vibes. We've talked a lot about M3K. We've even touched on, you know, the, the whole thing with Zebra, so Shun and this. But a unit case that I felt like is in a very interesting position coming out of Champion Gate weekend is Gold Class. And just the way that, you know, Gold Class came into the weekend with everyone being strapped up, uh, uh, Gold Class defeats M3K to main event night one. And uh, maybe this is just me here. I feel like that Gold Class might be perfect the way it is. And I did not see that happening. And for me to say a four-unit 
a four member unit is exactly where I want it to be. I think that gold class now with Minerid, especially with the changes that happen with Minerid after losing the Brave Gate and seeing that play out, I think that I I'm fascinated by gold class at this point in time far more than I expect it to be. So where are you at with the idea of Minorita possibly turning his back on the unit? Is that something you want to see or do you want, uh, do you want to see this play out uh, the way that it is currently? Oh, I, I think there's a lot of mileage in sad boy Minorita to be honest. So like, like the, when Ben K like basically electric chair chicken fought, got him on his shoulders to, to carry him out of Edeon arena. That's like, I was like, Oh, that's perfect. Like that's like, if he's going to go heal, like, yeah, I, w- I, he naturally is going to be a great heal. We've seen how he has been as Minorita and how annoying he's been kind of as like a tweener here, him going, he'll be, uh, would be obvious. I just want to kind of play out this hand with gold class though. Yeah. I, I'm with you because I'm fearful of sad boy Minorita. I I think, you know, when this unit was drawn up and and to go back to the conversation we had earlier, you know, it was, it was weird. The original incarnation of this unit was Himbo, Coach Minora, and Legacy Act Naruki Doi, and calling people ugly Kaito Ishida, and then you add Takumi Hayakawa into the mix as this mini me Minora. And, you know, the original goal of the unit was kind of to make fun of him. And and it was very awkward in the way that it was placed and the way that it was presented. And then Minorita made it work. And I just wonder now if he can pull off a heel turn. Like, it seems like that was the original intent and people fell in love with him to such a degree that he couldn't do it. And I, I just, I worry about upsetting the apple cart here. I really want them to explore Ben and Minorita together. And maybe that creates a situation for as much as I don't like inner unit fighting or at least inner unit matchups. Maybe that creates a situation of Minora and Hulk versus Ben and Minorita. I think that would be a really interesting uh, dynamic to play with, but I'm kind of with you even though it seems like they're changing Minorita's character and there's an evolution coming in the near future, I'm not interested in a ton of change in them right now. I kind of want to see them let this play out because they found a way to make 2023 BB Hulk interesting. And when you do that, you leave things as is until it becomes uninteresting. Yeah. Like the only reason I could see adding or changing things around is if you decide that Minorita now can not be a lost post basically and i don't see that happening with his size like that's naturally going to be the thing with him so you kind of have to keep him in this role unless because like the idea of heel turn minorita like even if it's just like like the crow minorita if you will (laughs) even if it's like that is like he's still five foot nothing at the end of the day he should be beaten by basically naturally everyone on that roster with the exception of maybe dragon kid physically and then and then punch Omanaga and soccer chikawa right yeah like it's just one of those things that like the aspect that he's always going to have to use all of his skills to work i don't think that works as a heel without drastically changing around like the logic of minorita yeah, I'm kind of with you. I just, I, I wouldn't touch it. You know, you can play with Minorita to some degree, but I think the end story, unless you're going to do away with Gold Class, which I don't think they're going to do, I think this year we're going to see a unit get added. I don't see, uh, for a while at least, a unit being taken away, and and, and put a pin on that. I want to kind of come back to that conversation, but I, I don't see Gold Class ending anytime soon. I guess let me throw it to you now. What do you think is the next unit to fold in Dragon Gate? I mean, as much as I hate to say it, because D Courage is, they're not going to really mess with D Courage, I think, right now. Like you, you, you had the whole storyline about both Kakuda and uh, Yoshioka being faced now. Like you can't really like have a turn happen in a three person's unit. Dai is not going to turn heel. So, like, D-Courage is off the table. 
No, you, uh, you got to put a bubble over D Courage. Do not touch them. You want to throw Dragon Kid in the mix, be my guest. That is the only thing you can change about this unit for the foreseeable future because everything about D Courage has worked to such an alarming degree. Right. And then Z Brats, like. It's like there's going to be change with Zebrats, but it's going to be heal unit change. It's not going to be this band's change because it's a heal unit and they have such a percentage in winning this band's matches that you just cannot vote for them to be disbanded. And then that means your eyes go look at either M3K or Natural Vibes. Natural Vibes has a legacy. It has has a full complement. You have a lot of stuff there. Or you have M3K. And I think M3K is the obvious one, even though Natural Vibes probably has another calendar year left in it, I would say, before you've really got to kind of exit strategy there. So I think it's M3K. I I mean, look, Vibes could be this generation's crazy max if they wanted them to be. I don't don't see a need for Vibes to go away anytime soon, but I also, if I was going to put money on a unit... The favorite might be M3K, but I I think I would side with Vibes just for the sake of shaking things up. Now, again, that's not something I necessarily want. It's not something that the company needs. I think Natural Vibes does a ton of good for them merchandise-wise, talent-wise, talent development-wise. Wrestlers get better when they wrestle Natural Vibes, but they teased getting rid of them last year with Zebrats. High end went away. Natural Vibes is still there. Zebrats is still there. I don't think they're entirely done with that feud. It's it's an interesting thing to look at. I, I I am hopeful. I'm an optimist, and I think, man, they're going to let this M3K thing ride just a little bit longer, and I hope they do, because I, obviously after this week, M3K was just on fire. Yeah, so like talking about units in this way, something that really kind of stuck out to me is D-Courage and Dragon Kid, and for weeks we were thinking like that might be like the thing coming out of Ray de Perejas, like how usually a, a unit would gain a new member through a summer adventure tag league but i'm now not getting that vibe i coming out of champion gate i'm wondering is the thing about the one person we have the biggest questions about is the answer there not a new millennials not the not a uh, leaving is it joining d courage should Ata join D Courage case? Why, that's, uh, you know. Loaded question. Loaded question, I know. You know, I was taking a walk today, and it was a little colder than I thought it was going to be. I wasn't, wasn't fully prepared for the cold. And in the middle of my walk, I, I felt like I was going to pass out all of a sudden, which is not, not a feeling I'm used to. Uh, I quickly had to run into a, a, a subway, the restaurant, not the train station. I had to run into a subway, and uh, I ordered a cookie and drank a, a little Coke real quick to sort of refresh. It was a very odd feeling. And I, I, I realized later, I p- almost passed out thinking about Ata and thinking about his health and thinking about his future and trying to remind myself, look, this guy has a neck that is in horrible shape. And I, I try to be sensitive to that and realize that this guy is a human and that he deserves to protect his health as much as he can. But I am also so fucking ready for Ata to do something interesting. It kills me watching him with these lively crowds who are eating out of the palm of his hands to see him do nothing do i think d courage is the answer no because d courage is this pure white meat baby face team that dragon kid fits into but ata does not a team ata rather muddies the water in a way that i just wouldn't play with d courage has worked so well now for so long over a year do not touch it do not give ata a chance to infect them in the wrong way i don't know i watched this uh pre-intermission finale between on night two of champion gate case that yamato doi Yoshida versus dragon kid and his two sons goofus and gallant and <laughs> the chemistry that dia and ata have especially dia being the baby face in peril hot tagging in ata it just made my mind wander it made me go to places enough that i wanted to talk about the idea of it's not dragon kid that they need they need ata the merch mover the guy provides a little bit of edge you know a little bit of trickery the mexico connection with yoshioka you could you could play up there the whole thing about how Ata in a lot of ways was kind of the 
ringleader of how these three guys kind of ended up together. You know, I mean, it, he shows up in R.E.D., eighth is unit, uh, Dragon or Die Inferno, uh, Hip Hop Kakuda, Ada's stewardship brings them in there, and they are all focused really in Inferno's case to take out Dragon Kid's true pupil. I think it could work. Case did did I move the needle for you whatsoever with this idea? You you moved the needle ever so slightly. I'm still not there. I, I do think the good news is. I think if they're going to do something with Ata, you know, my, my ideal scenario has been they do nothing with Yamato and they do something with Ata. Keep Yamato unaligned, keep him grumpy, keep him a little pissed off and on the undercard where I think he's super interesting, but do something with Ata. And I get the feeling as now, you know, we're through the first big weekend of the year dead or alive around the corner normally we would say king of gate around the corner but uh you know as as jay pointed out this week when the may schedule was released the name of the tour is hopeful gate and not king of gate so we don't know what's going on there but if you look at the immediate calendar i think we're going to get some movement here again dead or alive coming up may 5th in nagoya aichi japan very relevant as it's not only dragon kids hometown but sb kento's hometown and if you look at the upcoming schedule, which we referenced a little bit earlier, March 18th, the smallest big show of the year, but a big show nonetheless, uh, Memorial Gate in Wakayama. And then the next date they go to Aichi Nagoya at the International Conference Center. And all I can think of is last year in April, they run Kanazawa, which is Kakuta's hometown. That's where he makes a surprise return, turns his back on Zebrats and says he's going to be a baby face going forward. You have to wonder. If SB Kento and Takuma Fujiwara, who are no longer in Mexico, are going to show up at either Memorial Gate or at the house show the next day in Nagoya, if they're going to make their presence felt. And I think from there, once they come back, if Ata is going to do something, whether it's with or against them, we will know because he'll have to choose a side if he's going to. And if he stays on the sidelines, then then we're just going to have to accept that Ata is going to be unaffiliated for a very long time. Yeah, and the one thing, because uh, we talked a little bit about this on air, uh, off air, I don't have a lot more about like the whole thing with like SB and, and all that. I, I see that line up there. The The one thing is, I think Yamato, because Yamato said that he's not, he's going unaffiliated for one year. And I wonder if he's driven mad by... Ryuku Dragon, and then at the end of the year, heel turn. That's when you revise Zebrats into whatever the next heel unit is. I love that Yamato was this warrior for the independence on the the Junior All Star Festival. You know, complaining that New Japan only uses these guys when they need them. They don't care about them. And his gimmick in Ryuku Dragon Pro is that he doesn't need them. He doesn't care about them. It's a waste of time for him to be there. It's it's really good. I, I really like what Yamato is doing now that he's away from the uh, the big picture in Dragon Gate. It, it, it is something that, you know, as soon as he dropped that title, as soon as he dropped the Dream Gate, he has been so much fun after that. And, you know, he was even fun leading up to that Dream Gate when like MMA Yamato was fun last year. He was fun this weekend. He, he was fun this weekend against Konomami Ichikawa. I, I was talking to Rich Krejci of the flagship podcast today, raving, losing his mind over Yamato versus Ichikawa, which quite frankly, I, I thought was an average stalker match, but boy, did that strike a chord with him. Yeah, it was, it, it's something that I feel like coming out of this weekend and to kind of not necessarily put a bow on this because well, we have some other stuff we'll, we'll be talking about, but you look at these two shows neither of them longer than two and a half hours and up and down the show the showcase nothing there that i would say was bad nothing there that I felt like was wasting my time for a champion gate weekend that champion gate undercard we've gone through a case they are have been some stinkers over the years this might be one of the i know last year you we have all of the the, the title matches here not all the title matches delivered to that level here, but as complete shows, and especially with Osaka the way it was, I can't think of much that Dragon Gate 
did wrong coming out of Osaka this weekend. And I think I remember this as fondly as some of the other champion gates that we've talked about in the past with some of the big moments there. Yeah, I thought night one was a really strong show, top to bottom. Night two, uh, the title matches were good. Uh, I, real quick, because we haven't talked about it, what are your thoughts on the Triangle Gate match? Oh, Triangle Gate match. I... Susumu and Kanda. Uh, I... The, Con, Yazushi Kanda maybe had his best week of his career. Entering. Unreal. Unreal. Just tremendous stuff coming off of that cork in which... That is my new Dragon Gate match of the year right now is the Raid to Prey House Finals. I just, it was just unreal work there. Junior going one-on-one -on -one with Benke. We, we've all seen the German uh, herd around the world, but just like the way that like afterwards, like the way they played that out with him getting shoved into his dad and getting the Masakari, it was just phenomenal stuff. And I... You know, I went four and a quarter because I thought that it was as much of a step forward match for Mochizuki Jr. as anything that happened in Ray de Prejas. I was four flat. My match of the weekend was the Twin Gate match that I was four and a quarter on. Liked it just a hair more than Jason versus Minorita. What were your thoughts on the Twin Gate match? I was uh, four and a quarter. Actually, four and a half on that. So actually, that was my highest match out of Champion Gate. I really enjoyed like the sky. It, Shimizu is really amusing me right now coming back from the States. Like the pop that was for the sky high on Kakuda case was, was unreal. Like everyone freaked out for that. Yeah, there's a bunch of spots in this twin gate match that I, I really liked. The, the thing that I described in my review as basically a flash frog splash where Kakuta drills kz with a lariat and then out of nowhere yoshioka dives from the corner i mean it's basically like as soon as kz hits the ground yoshioka takes off and kz just got his knees up in time everything from that moment on to that match i thought was was simply terrific you know uh big time does a great uppercut power bomb combination there's a, a yuki yoshioka i guess he calls his move the bone mace but it was basically a, a Nick Gage choke breaker, sort of. It was like a sit out choke slam that just looked fantastic. A whole bunch of stuff in this match that was great. And it, it, it ends in the closing stretch where KZ hits the Swanton Bomb and then the Santo dive, that sort of uh, suicide dive out of the corner of the ring onto Kakuta. And then the big boss splash onto Yoshioka for the win. Like I said, four and a quarter of my match of the weekend. Should be noted, Mike. Madoka Kakuta did not get pinned. Are we are we buying into this idea that it's Skywalker versus Kakuta for the Dreamgate belt at Dead or Alive? I know that I was a little hesitant about Kakuta at Dead or Alive against Skywalker, but the way that they have treated Kakuta during this tournament, and more specifically Yoshioka taking the falls now, I, I'm on board now. Like, do, am I... Did I buy a first class seat for this train case? No, I did not. I it's still a flexible ticket, you know. Sometimes you gotta change things up. I don't know how my travel will be, but I think for now, yeah, I'm on board. With Kakuda, uh, Shun Skywalker. I, I just hope they bring back the great VTRs for that one because you could do so much with Kakuda's return around that match. It feels like the match you have to do if you hang on until World. I worry that Kakuta is going to lose some momentum, but right now, these are the two hot guys in the company. It's the dominant heel champion in Madoka Kakuta, and nobody feels hotter than Kakuta. You could go KZ, but one, he's a Twin Gate champion, and two, I think that's a little bit boring. You could do you know somebody from Gold Class, but they're all belted up. You're not going to do Dragon Daya. You're not going to do Yuki Oshioka. I don't see it being Eita. I don't see it being Doi. I think it has to be Kakuta. That's the right story to tell. And you look at that building and what I think that they have to do a cage match this year there to begin with. So you, you don't have to worry too much about other people figuring out what to do there because they kind of, in a lot of way, have been cage teasing Aichi over the last four years. Because oh, God, you... it's, it's, it's my favorite thing in 2020 when they gave 
you know, there was no Dead or Alive 2020, so they gave Tokyo the cage match. And the the tweets on my timeline from fans that live in Aichi going, wait, that's that's our thing. Why, why is Tokyo getting that? We the, we're the cage match city. And then they you know, they didn't get one in twenty one. Oh, they, they didn't, didn't get twenty one. What was the twenty one match? That was oh, it was they, the uh, it was uh, SB Kento and Dragon Kid and Yamato and Kai. That's yeah, right. it was that Parade House and Karibe, which did not feel as much like a cage match as twenty twenty did. God, I want to go back and rewatch that. That's an interesting match, just for the the way those four careers have gone since. That's that feels like it was so long ago. And then la- last year they didn't do one. Right. Yeah. What was the main event last year? Who was dreaming? It was Kai. Oh, it was Kai and Susumu. It was one of my matches of the year. It was fucking great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, it just it, look. It's Dragon Gate booking. We we could come out of this weekend and they could sell me on Genki versus Shun being the main event. Th- this is a company that when I think they're going to zag, they zig. You know, I-, I feel like I'm as in tune as anybody, and yet they continuously surprise me with their booking plans. It just feels like they've got a straight shot here with Shun versus Kakuta, the built-in story two years ago, youngest Dreamgate match ever. Kakuta blows out his shoulder 90 seconds into the match. They've got a story here. It's even better now because Shun is a heel. He was a baby face in that match. Very awkward for everybody involved. Just take the shot to the match. Yeah, there's no reason to complicate things. That's what the cage is for. Yeah, completely. And 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 that, you know, maybe that's an SB Kento spot. Maybe that's a Takuma Fujiwara spot. You do a little bit of natural vibes versus Zebrats there. I don't know what you do with the cage. That's a, I, I don't know, pure speculation just off the top of your head. Is it just a, a cage match this year where they just have stakes of a shaved head or a changed name or they have to wear a bathrobe to the ring or whatever it is? Or do you think there's something larger at play here? I just like look at how things are going that... Just like storyline wise, you know, it's like the one storyline that I could see end up being in the cage, but I don't think they'll put them in there. What's that? The Mochizukis. God, that'd be the, great to have those two in the cage together. We have basically two calendar months. You can get to that point in two months. You, you know, this would be the year if you're going to give somebody either a haircut or a real, not demotions, not the right word, but if you're really going to make somebody feel the brunt of a loss, this is the year to direct all of that towards Yo. He needs, he needs uh, a comeuppance of some sort in a major way. This feels like the year that he could be the guy stranded in the cage getting a haircut. Yeah, no, and I think that now that you've put that out there, that does feel pretty likely. Uh, case we did not uh, we touched on daiki earlier you brought this up to uh, as an idea idea here and i've been racking my brain best debuts yeah well we can get through this quick because i, I want to get into ray day Parejas before we leave but you gave the Dike, uh, daiki debut match four stars and that puts it in rarefied air and i think it has to be discussed among a few other debut matches the one that comes to mind it's funny he continues to come up in this episode uh, as we really touch on the various points of his career, but the debut match that I went four stars on in the moment was Strong Machine J's debut in, in April of 2019, Gate of Passion. You can read that review at VoicesOfWrestling.com. In the moment, I was absolutely floored by what I saw. It was him and the the Strong Machines. I think it was against Genki Susumu and KZ, that original Natural Vibes team. I still hold that as the gold standard of debuts. I... Yeah, you see, I was much lower on the whole Strong Machine act, you know? So, oh, yeah. Well, but, I, I, I quickly fell off that bandwagon, but I did love the debut. Yeah, yeah, no, it's... I might need to go back and look at the tape. Oh, no, we weren't doing the show at that point, I think. No, we were not, not weekly. Yeah, no, I was not as up on that, I believe. Uh, I, I, I do think that Strong Machine J, like... The thing about that was he really did show that he could do his dad's moves very well. And it was, was natural. Also... Like, he was natural. Like, he like he was, like, and it was something that I remember you writing about, like, how, like, he was composed and he was, like, looking like a wrestler immediately. And I still, I don't know a lot about his background. I don't know how old he is. I don't know where he trained if he did before Drangate, but he, he came across like a guy 
who had had a wrestling experience before that debut match. And obviously, you know, it, it, it became very favorable. And I, I also think it was very much an in the moment thing. And you and I remember this because I remember talking to you the night of this, but maybe newer fans don't realize, you know, at this point, we were a year removed from the OWE exodus and Shima and T-Hawk and Lindemann and Yamamura leaving. And all of a sudden, one night on like a Wednesday, Drangate announced that they were holding a press conference and nobody knew what it was about. Jay included. I remember when Jay was like, yeah, I don't I don't really know what's going on here. We were like, oh, my God, what's happening? Who, who's leaving? What is this? What catastrophe happened? It was the company closing. It was every bad thought that you could have had. Mike and I, of course, being two anxious men, rifled through a hundred negative scenarios and zero positive ones. And the press conference ended up being, hey, Strong Machine Jace Kidd is coming in. And then a month later, whenever it was, he had this debut match, and there was a ton of hype around it. And then I thought it delivered it. And to this day, you know, there's a few others that I can mention here, but I still think that is sort of the gold standard of Dragon Gate debuts. It it was something that was just such like a wild like five hours, basically. <laughs> like I was like talking with people and everyone's like, Yeah, no clue. No clue. No it clue. Felt, it felt it's hard to explain how bad it felt in the moment because it was just it was so mysterious where there was like there's no way this is good. This is so uncharacteristic for this promotion. There's no way this is good, especially coming off of the OWE exodus. And then it ended up being so anticlimactic. It was like, eh, kids coming in. We're gonna have them wrestle. Who that's it. Yeah, but after that, I mean, would you put 12-1 2016 as Really, like, because you like you look at that match for Yoshioka and Takashima. I don't know, like, you could really call that. Like, I I look at that more as a gut check match, as the best gut ma check match of all time. But I don't really like. Maybe I should recognize that more as like the debut for Yuki Yoshioka than the sole match in Katsumi Takashima's career. Okay, so I was so I was wrong. So Yoshioka debuted technically October 29th, and then. His second televised match is that 12-1-16. So I'm okay. not gonna I'm not gonna give that to him. Takashima, like we said, if that name doesn't ring a bell to you, there's, there's a, a kid. There, there's a kid. His name was Katsumi Takashima. He debuted in in Cork and Hall in this 10 man tag, one of our favorite matches of all time. And then he was out of the company by the end of 2017. I think there's there's four or five Takashima matches that made TV and. Outside of 12 1 16, they should all be on the network because the network has TV through 2017 on there. Um, but he was a guy who had eye injuries. And if you watch the match, Shima attacks this man, uh, this man's eyes in a way that is just, you have to see it to believe it. It's so vicious. Uh, but that, yeah, I, I'm with you. I, it's hard for me to count that match. Because Takashima, who was very good, and there was a ton of potential with this kid. It was never fully realized, obviously. Takashima was great, but he's the 10th best guy in a match with 10 guys. And here's the thing. I, he was such, like, he was gone, basically. Like, he, he wrestles a little bit. Uh, he was sent back to next Sanctuary shows, and then he was doing TV appearances. But here's the wild thing, Kiss. I could not remember him in a single one of these. Yeah, so 16 career matches, and some of those are next matches, some of those are prime zone matches. I mean, this guy it was basically once a month for about, uh, until until August of 2017, and then weirdly the last month of his career, he actually wrestles more than he ever did. His last match Again, this should be on the network. It was Kagatora, Kanda, and Takashima versus Don Fuji, Hyo, and Yuti from August 20th of 2017. That was in Hakata Star Lanes. So, yeah, there's just a, there's a handful of his matches floating out there. He was a very entertaining wrestler, very nimble, very flexible, and we never really saw what he could be. I mean, you see the randomness of this match right here, and again, this is on the network, the March 8th, 2017, Corkin, Genki Horiguchi, Jimmy Kness, Jimmy Kanda, and Sachi Hoko Boy versus Drastic Boy, Katsumi Takashima, Yosuke Santa Maria, and a baby Yuki Yoshioka. That's just wild. Like, I've, 
it felt like he got erased from existence after 12 1 26 <laughs> like uh, like i feel like i was mandela affected oh completely i mean it's it's his career is a non-entity after that point i mean there were some some dark matches here that i would love to see but you know they they didn't air anywhere they were house show dark matches he was you know match zero on these shows and his career was was over as soon as it began uh some of the other debuts that i think are worth mentioning if you count this one, the Masada Yoshino and brother Stevie C- uh, Sujimoto debut from the T2P show, I think that one has to be mentioned. I think BB Hulk's debut versus Susumi Yokosuka has to be mentioned. Uh, Kaito Nagano's debut this past year versus Kai has to be mentioned. And SB Kento and Naruki Doi versus, at the time, Takedo Kame and Yamato from 2019 has to be mentioned. Yeah, and... One that was outside of Dragon System that I remember as being like a crazy one was Utami's debut, Utami Hayashishida against Jungle Kiona in 2018. Like that's like the only other one that could really, that really sticks out to me in the way that Daiki's did. I would love to know from the New Japan Hive, what's like, what's the best debut young lion match of the bushi road era is there one that really sticks out because i i mean basically anything from show and and uh and yo onwards i would like to know if there's one that sticks out in their minds would it have to be katsumura yeah just of his that's, size? that's certainly in the running the other one that came to mind and i'm trying to think if it was his debut match it was Alex Shelley versus Jay White. Now, that okay. wasn't that wasn't White's debut to wrestling. He had obviously been in New Zealand a little bit before that. But I remember Jay White's first New Japan match. This was right after World New Japan World became a thing, and everybody was watching every New Japan house show. But Alex Shelley versus Jay White was a great match. Yeah, no, that would make sense. Like, this, this 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 is unbelievable. January thirtieth, twenty fifteen. Alex Shelley versus Jay White. Kyle O'Reilly versus uh, Yohei Kamatsu, and Young Bucks versus Kushida and Mascara Dorada. First three matches on that show. Yeah, my brain just flickered out of existence thinking about Young Bucks versus <laughs> Mascara Dorada. Oh my god, that's excellent. Mascara that's, Dorada. I'm, sorry. Uh, look, I, there's only so many hours of the day. I don't have time to go back and rewatch that, but that sounds fun. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. But it, I, I, I guess like the overall point with like me and Daiki and why that resonated so much just was like, I don't think that match is a three and a half star match outside of Cork and Hall. It yeah, has that, to be that, there. That, that'll be the interesting thing to see is when Daiki goes to Kobe and Osaka, Kyoto, Fukuoka, what does he look like? Because we know in Corkin, until something changes, he's going to be a star in that building. Absolutely. So in case you, you talked about you want to hit this fist that quickly because we want to rank Ray de Parejas before we get out of here because Ray de Parejas wrapped up on Thursday. Uh, we, D Courage won. I don't feel like we mentioned that D Courage won uh, Ray de Parejas and we're almost in at the two hour mark here. But interesting tournament. I while I was walking Pudge today, I was listen, getting them ranked in my head in a way. So how do you want to do this? Well, real quick, let's not, as I say this two hours into a podcast, let's not bury the lead here. First of all, March 2nd, Corkin did 1,186 fans for comparison this year. That is up from the January Corkin shows, neither of which, or I guess uh, the first one, which did not crack 1,000 fans, the second, which did just over 1,000 fans, and down about... 12 fans from February. So basically flat, we'll call it flat from February. Good number there. Like I said, that number was 1186, which is about a hundred or so off from what has been considered a cork and sellout, uh, at least as of this month. But the main event, Mike, let's clear the runway here. Talk about this for just a second. D courage versus M three K Kanda and Susumu. You have the floor, my friend. I don't think that I've seen a Yazushi Kanda match in the last decade as good as this match. That's including, I'm talking about his performance in particular. That's including the Jimmys versus Matt Blanky at Oda. Like the last, the last Kanda match that is in the running 
is Mochizuki versus Kanda from 2011. Yeah, so we're talking at least 11 years here. It starts off with the Tope and Tope Kon Hello, and they go right into the M2K combination. Uh, it's Kamikaze and the Gekijudo elbow drop. And as soon as that happens, D Courage takes over and kind of just destroys them for the greater part of, tw- of half an hour. And it's something that, like, the thing that got to me in this match was not just, like, how great Yazushi Kondo was, not just how uh, Susumu Yokosuka or Susumu Mochizuki yet again doing it. Madoka Kakuda in a period in one night case went from, like, my most improved to a legit most outstanding case. He is amazing. This is the best match of Kakuda's career, in my opinion, to date. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, the conversation for most outstanding as we approach the end of the first quarter of the year, it's Brian Danielson, it's Mystico, and it's Madoka Kakuta. And you can put them in whatever order you like, but for as good as Okada's been, you know, I know some people are into Taichi. I, I don't know. I mean, Miyohara gets a lot of buzz. That one's always tough for me because I'm, I'm just, I'm a quarter star lower on every Miyohara match than everybody else. I know there's guys in the running, but to me, those are the three, and they they have a gap between them and again that second group of Okada, Miyahara, whoever you want to list uh, you want to list there. It's Danielson, it's Mystico, and it's Kakuta. And my God, were Kakuta and Yoshioka great throughout this entire tournament? Yeah, look, uh, going through it, I think by acclamation, there they won the tournament. They were the most outstanding team in the tournament. After that case. How do how do you have Doyama stacking up? I have them as the third best team in the tournament. I, let's uh, let, let's work backwards here and go from ten down to one as we kind of close out this podcast. Who let, let let me ask you this: Who is your worst team in the tournament? I think it's JNF, and it's just because I'm not a strong machine army person. I really, I was higher on it than you. I really liked their Yama Doi match, and that kicked them up a few spots. That was a really solid match, but it just did not really keep it up for you. Is it all caps for you for ten? Yeah, Hyo and Ishan, just uh, a, a disappointing tournament. You know, I, I did not think Hyo's shtick landed with me this time around, and Ishan was interesting, but not necessarily good. Ishan regressed by the end of the tournament. I, I agree. I, I'm ready for him to to kind of kick it up a notch. Yeah, so they would have been my number nine uh, second worst. Uh, what was your second worst? Ben K and Minorita. Just, I, I thought they started strong, and by the end, thought they lost their oomph, thought they lost their drive a little bit. Yeah, and uh, I had the eighth. So j- 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 we're just piggybacking here. And, uh, and I and I had Strong Machines eighth. So we're, we're, our bottom three is roughly the same. Yeah, and it, it is something that, like, in a tournament like this, when you have someone that's going to win, win the wooden spoon, they're going to go over, o- and it's not going to be in doubt. Like, after the first match, we're like, okay, there they'll just get ready for a whole tournament of that. And other than the fact that Ben K eventually decided to get in and do the dirty work in the last match, by matches two, by matches three and four, you kind of were done with Ben Rita. If you had Ben K start like match three, going like, oh, well, the first two matches we just got ran over. I got to interject in, and maybe it ends that he gets them out of the cellar and they get two points because of Ben Cage deciding to do it from there. I take it all from here and then you go do Minorita sad boy gimmick. Then they might have resonated a little bit more, but you could tell what their deal is. And I think the thing really about this bottom tier is it got very samey with them very quickly. I agree. So your number seven in Ray Dayberry House was And this is where we get to a cliff. Uh other than the match that they had in Corican, Double Dragon Ugh. was not it for me. I'm with you. I, I expected more from them. Yeah, and, and it's just something that, like, maybe it is that, like, you had the nostalgia thing and the idea that Dragon Daya came out with the mask. But it, I did like them versus Shinkai towards the end of the tournament, but that was really kind of like that, and it's only two matches out of five. Where do you go after that? I think, and 
this is a me thing, I think. It's very... I think it might be uh, Minohulk. I think it might be them. So I've got Susumu and Kanda in this spot, and then Hulk and Minora uh, slotted above them in that sixth place place position. Both teams over-delivered. Obviously, Susumu and Kanda uh, bulked up by the finals there and how great they were. And Hulk and Minora, I go back to the first match uh, of the tournament for them, that Cork and Hall 20-minute time limit draw before we knew that the tournament was going to be filled with draws. That was that was shock and awe to me. You know, I did not see that coming. I did not see that match being as good as it was. I actually remember expressing to you in the moment, you know, at the end of January going, I, I don't I don't know if Hulk and Minora are strong enough to headline this show. I, I worry that they're not going to be able to keep up. And Yamadori were great the match before, and then I thought Hulk and Minora topped them in the main event, and, and that went a long way with me, even if their tournament wasn't great every single match. They were so good in their first match that it, it, it kind of boosted them up a little bit. So, Susumu and Kanda are my six. Yeah, so okay. It, it is something that, if it was not for the final, Susumu and Kanda would be looking in that bottom tier. Completely, completely agreed. They, they were storing it all up for that because everything before that kind of became super samey and kind of depressing, to be frank. Where do you go after that? This is... It's harder... It's hard for me to put rookie tag higher than five. I've got them. I've got them a few spots ahead. I, I'll say this, uh, and we can kind of break down these teams as you list them here. They play to our taste. You know, we really like the the young Drangate style of wrestling, but they were just a level above what I thought they were going to be. I mean, the Mochizuki match from Fukuoka, the Mochizukis versus Kato and Nagano was so much better than I thought it was going to be. You know, I, I I thought it would sort of be like a fun eight minute sprint that's violent and thus we like it. And thus we throw it on our spreadsheet at four stars. I wasn't expecting that to be a complete 20 minute performance where everybody looked like a world beater. You know, the, I obviously have a ton of stock invested in them, but they went up a level in Ray Day Barajas in a way that I just wasn't anticipating. No, that's entirely fair. So who did you have at five? I would have had Shun and Kai. You see, I have Shun and Kai a little bit higher than that. So this is working interesting here. Uh, well, what was it about them that you had them at fifth? I simply didn't like them as much as the other teams I liked in this tournament. My big picture thought coming out of Ray Day Parejas is they have to do this again next year because the the bottom half of the bracket uh, was not great. The top half I thought was otherworldly, and I, I kind of sung it from the mountaintops. People need people that slept on this tournament. You know, some tastemakers that were not in tune with this tournament began. They have to play catch up and they have to watch these matches because I would I would really question anybody that didn't come away from Ray Day Perejas with a few, maybe not match the year level matches, but a few holy shit that was great level matches. No, I'm with you with it, and it's the perfect thing for January and February when Dragon Gate does not pull focus really. To just do that tournament up. Uh, my fourth is going to be co a controversial one. I just can't put them higher than this. That's where I have Doyama. I have them fourth. I've got them third. So, I, you know, okay. uh, same deal. It was something that, like, I think I was lower on Doyama stuff during this tournament other than Corican. But it was something that for me, when I look at the other three teams, the other three teams were just heads and shoulders above in my mind. So... Yeah. Yeah, my top three is Yamadoi at three, Jason and Jackie at two, and then Yoshioka and Kakuta at one. What, or do you differ there? Or I guess what, what's your what's your top three? Because you gave me your number four. Yeah, my number my top three would be the Mochizukis at three, uh, Kung Fu Masters at two, and then D Courage at one. Yoshioka and Kakuta. I had five matches. If you include the tag title match at Champion Gate. I had five of their matches hit the spreadsheet in the last month. That is a pretty good month of wrestling for those guys. And it's something that Madoka Kakuda has not made a step wrong since facing Shingo Takaki. I have never seen like such a abrupt uh, before and after in a wrestler as, as we have seen since Final Gate 2022. 
Yeah, and you know, not to my point just a second ago, not only is it five notebook matches, it's I have three of uh, of his matches and his matches with Yoshioka at four and a half stars from this tournament. I know you went even higher. You went four and three quarters on the Ray Day Parejas main event. Uh, but I've got that at four and a half. I've got him and uh, Yoshioka versus Hulk and Minora, four and a half. And I've got him and Yoshioka versus Jason and Jackie at four and a half. So just a brilliant month for them. It was really something special and hopefully something that they will continue to do. Looks like we're not getting another tournament in the first half of the year. We'll see where it goes with King of Gate from there. Case, we are under two hours. Should we hold off and do a marathon edition of Remember That Guy, or do you want to do a quick one before we're out of here? Let's hold off on it. We got we got a lot of free space for next week, but you know, if it if it wasn't made clear from all of the all of the banter that we've discussed over the last two hours, the four title matches from this past weekend. Kato and Nagano versus Mochi Fuji, the Daiki debut from Korokin, and the Ray Day Parejas finals. Those are the matches you need to go out and watch if you have not seen them already. Yeah, and all of them are on the network, at least from when you get this, for another 24 hours. So Korokin will come off on the 9th, and then it will be the 11th and the 12th for Champion Gate. But case, in that case, that's going to do it for us this week. If you... Uh, wanted to follow the show, follow us at Open Voice Gate on Twitter. Cases at underscore in your case. I'm at Fujiheya. While you're at it, go to iTunes, go to uh, Google Podcasts, go to Spotify. Rate and review. For some reason, it really is. Whenever you search for Dragon Gate Podcasts, those reviews pop up first. So that's just a matter of that. So the best way to one of the best ways to support the show is to go and do that for us. But that's going to do it for this week and. That's going to do it really for Dragon Gate until Memorial Gate. But we'll be back with you next week. We're, we're figuring it out here. I've threatened a marathon edition of Remember That Guy. There's a lots of guys we got to remember. But we'll, we will be sure to let you all know on social media what the next episode will look like. But for case, I'm Mike. Thanks for listening to Voice Gate. We'll be back with you next week. Take care. Hey, kids, do you like wrestling? Well, we like wrestling, too. We are Shake Them Ropes here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Myself and Chris Novembrino kind of doing a lazy river of wrestling criticism, going through the news and whatever happened in stateside television wrestling. And also, you know what? Sometimes we just like to watch old stuff and talk about that, too. Love for you to give us a listen. If you haven't already, we are Shake Them Ropes here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Hello everyone, my name is Taylor. And I'm Kelly. And we are the co-hosts of Jumping Bomb Audio, the podcast all about Joshi Pro Wrestling here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Every other Monday, we are with you talking about the biggest news in Joshi along with show reviews, previews, and much, much more. So if you're new to Joshi or you've been a longtime fan, this is the show for you. We've got something for everyone here. So check us out, Jumping Bomb Audio.